Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, at least. <laughs> Here we are. Hi, yes. Mohamed. Uh, thank you. I um, suppose that um, um, Nolwenn already told you, thank you for your presentation. It's really great. Thank you. Yeah, already. <laughs> my, uh, my spouse is a professional photographer, so I have That's her to thank. Why. Yeah, the, the quality, the quality of the image was very striking. Now we know why. <laughs> That's not only, I was not only talking about the quality of the image, but also the content. <laughs> Weren't you? Okay. <laughs> oh. okay. <laughs> how, how are we going to proceed? Are we online, Anne? Yes, everyone is, uh, the, the, you're on, you are online, there's no problem. <laughs> okay, good. All right, so we are on the air, so it's really the real thing. Mm-hmm. All right. It's, uh, it's on YouTube right, right now. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mohaned, for the presentation. I assume that people have had time to uh, watch it. And um, as I said earlier, and I don't know whether people heard it or not, um, Nolwen and I were extremely impressed. We're very impressed with your presentation and very happy to have it. So thank you for uh, contributing to our seminar. Uh, you are a PhD student in um, California in LA at UCLA and uh, you're working on silent cinema and this presentation is about, uh, I mean, discusses various issues that have to do with uh, dubbing, subtitling and uh, different dialects, um, um, Arabic dialects. So um, we have questions for you and uh, unless you would like to make a short introduction for your uh, for people who may be listening at the um, at this point yes if you don't mind yeah go ahead it's well, all uh, yours. I'd like to um, um, sort of uh, explain why it is that how it is that I came into this work or what attracts me to it you see I'm principally being trained as a film historian uh, and my um, what they call in, Amer in America a dissertation, or what they call in Europe a thesis paper, has to do with the silent cinema in Egypt. And so one might wonder what it is that attracted me to a paper about or to the subject of dialect, considering that I'm studying silent cinema, and, it's, and certainly dialect in contemporary cinema and television, uh, really, is because... Uh, and I think I sort of allude to it in uh, in the presentation uh, about uh, the 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 tongue of funding, is that I'm trying to conceive of ways um, better ways to understand the region from which I descend. You know uh, the the um, the the sort of the national project has been put into question, especially since the various Arab uprisings we call uh, Arab Spring. And in a way, um, when, I, when, I noticed, when I noticed that, that um, uh, programs, non-Arabic language programs, were being dubbed into dialect, uh, south, uh, sort of uh, into a, a dialect Arabic rather than modern standard Arabic, that piqued my curiosity. And I, begin to sort of, I began to sort of examine this, and on a theoretical level, I think that I'm interested in dialect because it speaks to a different kind of co configuration to the region we call the Arabic-speaking world than the national kind of border-based conception. And in a way, this relates to my study because the time I am looking at uh, in the early 20th century for my dissertation project is a time that predates the national project or the national conception of geographically and governmentally in the Middle East. So that's the connection between those two, really. Thank you. 
um, thank you, Mohane. And uh, these are these are questions we are um, quite familiar with because um, um, Abdel Ben Shenan, Nolwen Mangan, myself uh, have put together a volume on the circulation of film in North Africa and uh, the Middle East, and we're very interested in issues of national, regional, and transnational. Um, you know, both in relation to the circulation of film, but also uh, in relation to audiences. So um, I must say I've got small and larger questions. Uh, Nolwen, uh, would you like to start or? No, I mean, I've got plenty of questions, so but you can start <laughs> if you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I mean, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, I mean, one question I was really interested in in relation to the three case studies uh, you've presented is that actually, if you look at the map of film production in the Arab world, uh, places like Morocco and Lebanon have become, you know, film producers right? Mainly Morocco. Um, places of funding have changed as well with uh, the Gulf funding, uh, I mean, being eager to fund films. And I was wondering in relation to, for instance, the examples you gave, um, Rock the Cash Bar in particular, uh, but it would apply to the others as well. Uh, do you consider that um, there are new stars emerging that are that whose uh, career could be related to um, the dialects they use, or um, are other characteristics more important in the you know in the tra uh, in the trajectory in the careers of stars today. Could it yeah. be, for instance, um, I mean, I'm thinking of Hiyam Abbas, who's got political commitments and uh, is, I mean, outspoken on various issues. Um, and there are other issues as well that could be raised. But is dialect an important um, thing in um, the career of a star? Well, uh, the, the extent to which, that's an excellent question, the extent to which dialect is important to the career of aspiring cinematic actors, uh, I think depends on a number of, um, of, of conditions. Uh, I think um, whether they're based in the Arab world uh, or outside of the Arabic speaking world or the Arabic speaking region is one consideration which part of the uh, uh, Arabic-speaking region they live in is a second um, consideration. And certainly a third, uh, and maybe most, the most important consideration, is the kind of work that they expect to get. So if, for example, they are, the actor is in Syria or in Egypt or in Algeria or in Morocco, somewhere like that, and um, uh, up to this point, the majority of work that they've received has been on lo um, local projects, domestic projects, then perhaps they're not so motivated to expend their energy trying to learn dialects, uh, especially considering, uh, and this is something I really haven't investigated deeply, but something you might have noticed in the presentation I made, I asked um, Khaled Abu Najah, the, the Egyptian star about, whether or not he encountered dialect coaches. And he says, yes, we have them in Egypt. But, but then on the other hand, it seems like in his case, and he is a, you know, at this point, he's a cinema star. So this sort of relates to the, to the extension of the point I was making, which is that if you have projects coming to you or expect to have uh, roles offered to you that would, would, in, would involve uh, speaking in a dialect other than the Arabic dialect that you are familiar with, then you're probably going to start trying to expand your capabilities as an actor to include the ability to take on other dialects. Whether or not the dialect coaches in Egypt can teach dialects other than those within the borders of Egypt that come up in the, you know, in the, the Egyptian programming, for example, TV and cinema, 
Uh, I don't know, really. But uh, so this is sort of I've looped around, and I'm coming to answer back to you, answer your question and say, I expect there to be more interest by actors to develop capabilities of speaking in different dialects because I think that the kind of transnational and multinational production whereby whereby um, there's reason to hire Arab, Arabic speaking actors even if they are not familiar with the dialect spoken by the character in the project, I, I see that expanding. So I see the, the opportunity, uh, more and more opportunity of Egyptians playing Syrians and Kuwaitis playing Syrians and Moroccans playing Egyptians and et cetera, et cetera. Now, it, it's, it's pretty, there's a long-standing tradition of uh, non-Egyptians learning the Egyptian dialect. Uh, you may know, for example, the, the Tunisian uh, film star who mostly works out of Egypt now, named Hind, Hind Sabri. Hind Sabri. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yes, yes. People boast about how like, she can speak <laughs> Egyptian dialects relating to class and background, geographic background and such. I, I see uh, this happening in the opposite direction in the future, whereby like established Egyptian actors may want to take on non-Egyptian dialects with more confidence in the future. I mean, I still remember the actor Noura Sharif, who's probably one of the most esteemed Egyptian actors of the last quarter century. And he played Palestinian cartoonist Najil Ali uh, in a, a biography. Uh, by the excellent Egyptian director, Atif Salim, but he butchered, he being Nur sharif an excellent actor, butchered the Palestinian dialect. I mean, it ruined the film form. So um, I think that stars of Nur sharifs caliber are probably not going to take a chance on playing a character with a, di with a, with a dialect not familiar to themselves without training in the future. I think the exposure level and the risk is too high. And then that leads me exactly to my second question. <laughs> and it has to do with audiences, because this is something I've come across very often when I am with, uh, I mean, when I'm at a festival, for instance, with a Moroccan who is going to say, uh, oh, I hated that film because she had an Algerian accent and in a Moroccan film, I mean, that's not possible. So, I mean, it's just impossible. And this is something that European audiences are not sensitive to, right? This is something that they, they don't know. So, what's the extent to which, I mean, uh, European audiences and the desire to get uh, uh, for, a, for a director or for a production to get noticed uh, in Europe, right, may have an impact on, uh, on the casting that is going to spoil the film for um, Maghrebi or uh, Middle Eastern audiences, but that uh, are going to be a plus for um, uh, European audiences. And if we talk about Rock the Cash Bar, right, um, for us it was perfectly fine to have Iyam Abbas, Lubna uh, Azabal, Omar Sharif, right? For us, these are fairly well known actors, um, or very well known actors and actresses. And all these differences, we just don't know. I mean, we can't feel them. What do you think? If I may add a question to your question, Patricia, yeah. in terms of, of language, the opportunity could also be starring in films in French or in films in English. So in terms of career opportunity also for the actor, is it more interesting to make sure that they know how to speak French or develop in English than maybe work on these differences that maybe do not touch um, an audience outside the region? Yeah. So let me start with the second uh, uh, half of the question, uh, the, 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 the follow-up question. I, I agree with you. There is not the, 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 
I, I would think that for the average actor with an interest in multinational or transnational projects, somebody who, an actor who can expect to get offers like that, there is still, you know, there are only so many hours in the day. And, it, you know, I imagine that the benefits to improving one's English, for example, or to improving one's French, uh, outweigh, still outweigh the benefits to learning a dialect in Arabic, for example, other than one's own. Because, you know, language is not only important for the performance. Before you can, before you can um, um, perso personify or take on a dialect in a performance, you first have to get offered the job. And to get offered the job, it might help if you can communicate in a way that impresses, you know, the producer or what have you. Um, and back to the first half of the question, I would say, you know, it's a matter of um, priorities, I think, to those, to the principles uh, involved in a project. So one of the priorities to filmmakers and to film producers is to get the film sold so as to make as much money as possible to offset expenses, you know, the, the, uh, the cost of the film, and hopefully though often unlikely, make some money. And um, stars are useful to securing uh, what are called um, advanced distribution deals, you know, whereby a distributor is willing to sign off to buy the rights to a particular territory based on a conversation about the script and the naming of two stars that the distributor thinks will secure a certain level of attendance and therefore a certain revenue in the territory so when you know often you know when, when uh, you know, i live in los angeles and you know that hollywood is often accused of and rightly of not giving enough parts roles to non-white actors and you know one might wonder is that it, what is i mean is it is it an ingrained kind of racism whereby producers um, uh, you know, uh, bigoted against black people? No, it's it's much more fine a matter of financial interest. Producers are convinced that white actors, predominantly, are, are better recognized and can secure better revenues when the film comes out, and so they are reluctant to start sort of casting their films with black actors. And I think, to some extent, what we have with filmmakers who are like Arabic projects, Arabic language projects, but are hoping to get distribution deals in especially Western Europe and North America, is that they figure, okay, if I cast Omar al-Sharif to play, if, if I cast Omar al-Sharif or Hiyam Abbas to play a Moroccan, I might incur the wrath of Moroccans who are going to say, why are you hiring non-Moroccans to play Mo Moroccan characters? And I might incur the wrath of, of, of Arab, Arabs in the region, Arabic speakers, because the film will strike them as inauthentic. Because they will get the impression that the reason that the director, Marakshi, hired these non-Moroccan actors is because she wanted stars for her film. Marakshi will probably know this in advance. And she is going to cast her film with that kind of potential damage in the calculus. Of the of the benefits and uh, disadvantages of casting people who are quote unquote authentic, you know, and that's a whole nother discussion, you know. I mean, aren't actors supposed to adopt personas other than their own, and wouldn't that include a geographic dimension or an ethnic dimension? So then, why are we rather concerned about a certain authenticity in the hiring of actors, and especially when it comes to uh, let's be frank, non-white actors in what in in a in a sort of a world uh, market whereby wherein ninety percent of the films that get theatrical distribution are Hollywood films. Thank you. Thank um, you. I have a, a question which um, is related to the nineteen twenties and nineteen thirties. So I don't know if you have researched that point yet. Um, yeah. It's about the arrival of, of talking movies, and I'm thinking about. Hollywood, of course, um, and when 
sound started to be added to film, they were Van Hedgen has it, and there they, that some uh, actors so their careers broken because they couldn't speak perfect English. Um, and then you you mentioned in your presentation that there are a varieties of dialect within Egypt. So I was wondering when Egyptian films started to talk, was there the same kind of problem in terms of which which variety of Egyptian Arabic was to be chosen, and what happened there? Is there something that happened there? You know, I think my answer to this question is going to be quite short because it's principally, I don't know. That's uh, why, uh, yeah, that's why I was asking. Maybe you had not researched that point. I yet. Uh, I'll tell you what I have come across. What I have come across in, uh, and, you know, my research sort of ends around 1934. Yeah. Uh, my investigation so far, which is about two years into since the release of the first Egyptian talkie. Uh, I will say, that in the tail end of the silent era, mm -hmm. there was a lot of criticism in Egyptian press about so -called, uh, the so-called Bedouin genre. It was almost like the Egyptian equivalent of the Western. Uh, and the, the criticism mainly had to do with the falsehood of the depiction of the Bedouin characters in these films. I mean, uh, I think there was one called Kiss in the Desert by uh, 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 directed, directed, acted by the Lama brothers, where they had, I think, like Bedouin characters sipping champagne or something, <laughs> sipping out of glasses in the tent. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that didn't come off well. I wish I could speak to um, the kinds of, uh, the kind of training that went into the um, uh, the continuation of these Bedouin roles into the Toki era, mm -hmm. but I'll be honest in saying that I just haven't researched that. Mm. Yeah, that's why I hear. <laughs> but that's I think that's an interesting question to have. I think so. Well, very, I think I very much think so. And you know, when I when I hear non kyrene dialects in Egyptian films, non cairo based dialects, I do my ear, my ears do perk up. But I also must admit, because I myself am not Egyptian, you know, I'm still training myself to some extent to notice these differences and hope that uh, by spending uh, more time in Egypt doing research, part of the training will be uh, of my own ear. You know, I don't know if academics often, you know, cinema scholars, we were taught to train our eyes, mm -hmm. but maybe not as much our ears. Mm -hmm. That's true. So You've got a point a, there. <laughs> definitely. I've got a more contemporary question, which is on the um, the the dubbing and the subtitling. Because um, I was reading an article by Rames Malouf saying that dubbing was not really um, favored in the Arab world. And that's a generalization, as you said. Um, and it developed the idea that television, and especially satellite, was really the phenomenon which brought dubbing uh, into Arab programs. So I wanted to have your impression uh, on that. Yes, I agree for the most part. Dubbing has always been used for cartoon, for animation. Mm -hmm. And animation um, has certainly been broadcast on uh, national, and by national I mean terrestrial, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, channels for decades. And so uh, dubbing was always part of uh, television stations programming in that regard, in that animation was always dubbed. Uh, and I do think that other programs historically have been dubbed as well. For example, uh, documentary programs, you know, shows about animal life and such, life on the planet. These were often dubbed. With uh, a voiceover. You mean, or? Yes, uh, with a voiceover. Although that was historic, typically, almost always, from my uh, rec from my investigation and my recollection, uh, in modern standard Arabic, it's really the narrative shows whose dubbing I think is a more recent phenomenon. And I agree that in that case, satellite has been a huge boon, a major contributor to this phenomenon not only to dubbing programs that historically would have been subtitled, 
but also to dubbing in various dialects mm -hmm. and kind of embracing the idea, this is on the part of broadcasters, embracing the, the idea that Arabic language speakers would be willing to train and were ready to, to watch programming that was in dialects other than oh, their own, other than Egyptian, because Egyptian really is a special case. Mm -hmm. And I've just, so maybe I can tell you more about it later, but I just finished an article about Hollywood films uh, in the 1950s and the four or five years in which they actually dubbed Hollywood films in Arabic and I know all the problems they encountered. <laughs> I know, I know, yeah, we're going to have to talk because I know a bit about this in the 1930s. Ah, the, cool. Yes, and, and, and I did come across um, some primary documents that discuss this. Mm. So you and I should chat. <laughs> and the, the, the point I was making, not that uh, we should chat more because we know, but about the, the, that the variety of uh, Arabic present in the region was a major, major obstacle because they were not quite sure in which variety they should actually dub their films. And that was the reason why they stopped also this um, experiment. That's what I see. Point. So it didn't occur to those who were performing the dubbing that Egyptian dialect in the 1950s would have been pervasive enough at that point to to be an option? I think or the option? from what I found, it, it is the one that chose. But then they felt they would not, they were supposed to cover North Africa and the Middle East, what, the same print with the same dubbing. Mm. So, you know, they felt it was not profitable enough and it would not um, increase spectatorship enough because in the end, maybe the spectator in North Africa, they would prefer film dubbed in French anyway, you know, than I it see. sounds. I see. Different. So this would, these would have been uh, English language films dubbed in French for a uh, Northwest Africa, Maghrebi audience? Exactly. So paradoxically, um, in North Africa, they would welcome more a film in French than they would in Egyptian Arabic. I'm um, speaking okay. Hollywood films, of course. That, yes. that was related also to the very interesting point you're making uh, about Rock the Casper. Um, the fact that French facilitates the idea of having a pen, um, a pen Arab uh, cast. That was yeah. a very interesting point that you were making there, I found. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was, uh, I mean, I sort of put myself in the mind of the production team and um, you know, you could, you could it, 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 within the within the film's diegesis, within a, a story taking place that involves characters in Morocco, in Tangiers, no less, and of the upper crust, no less, then it would have it would have seemed um, it would have been uh, it would have not surprised an audience, including really an Arabic-speaking audience that uh, these family the, the, these people would speak French predominantly, uh, even with each other. I, I would think that, you know, I don't think that that would surprise people um, in the rest of the region concerning, especially Morocco, and maybe less so as you go, and Morocco, Algeria, maybe less so as you go east, except for maybe, I would say, Maronite Lebanese. Mm -hmm. You know, who may speak French within the among among themselves. Uh, um, at this point, I mean, at, th at this point in history. Uh, and uh, as far as you know, the dubbing that was done in the 1930s, apparently, there was a um, a an objection in Egypt to dubbing the same thing. To dubbing um, English language Hollywood films in French, uh, or bringing the prints in by way of France, mm -hmm. and the reason that the that the author and I can't remember where I saw this piece, the reason that the author suspected that it didn't it didn't stick with the audiences is because is because um, uh, the the the, the, the audi cinema audiences in Egypt in the upper in the early thirties would have been um, educated enough and familiar enough with French culture that to hear like Parisian French being spoken by some thuggish New Jersey criminal 
wouldn't have struck them as authentic and they, oh. they would have like but I, I i can't remember quite where i found that i've got so much research that i've accumulated in the last few months on my research trip that i still haven't gone through well you find it you send it to me <laughs> i will yeah, you, you have more questions, Patricia. So. <laughs> um, yes, actually, um, I've got. I mean, going back to Rock the Cash Bar because I think it's a really interesting um, case study. Um, you referred to the fact that um, the production chose uh, a pan Arab cast rather than Burr um, actors. And there is something quite surprising because Burr actors are really uh, do very well at the French box office. And um, I think they've got success as well, primarily in the Maghreb. So do you think it means that the production uh, was trying to reach uh, an even larger um, um, I mean, an, uh, an even larger number of countries in the Arab world and extend beyond what would be um, North Africa? I can't speak definitively, obviously, since I don't know the details, but I can conjecture. And here is what I expect might have happened. Uh, you know, you know, as I, as I mentioned, I did investigate which countries had a theatrical release of Rock the Casper, and the only one that did was Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon does have a pretty healthy uh, cinema to population ratio compared to um, most countries in really all of the Arab countries except for Egypt, the UAE, Qatar, and maybe 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 a couple of other Gulf countries. <laughs> but it's, it was still really quite a restricted release, it seems. And I don't think that it, um, I didn't get the impression, and the research I did did not turn up any kind of, um, um, really any uh, screenings in the Gulf or Egypt where money could be made uh, on a distribution deal. So my guess, considering that the directors uh, project, according to what I found, the follow-up project that she was working on was a U.S.-based project. I think she was going after the Anglo's. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I think that I think that Omar Sharif and Nadine Lebaki and Hiam Abbas all have, in one way or the other, shown up uh, uh, in the North American market to an extent that has captured the attention of industry, press, etc. So, you know, Variety and the Hollywood Reporter know who Hiyam Abbas is. Mm. You know, they know that she, she's, she's acted in American films, Enrique and The, Vis, uh, the Visitor. Yes, uh, yes, yes, they, she has. They know who Nadine Lebaki is. They know, I mean, Caramel uh, got, uh, got theatrical distribution in, uh, in the United States, which is really difficult for uh, films from the Arab world. And as you know, she won the top prize in Toronto for Where Do We Go Now? And then Omar Sharif is arguably the the, great, the best known international star, uh, Arab star ever. So I think that she was eyeing, she was hoping for a distribution deal here. And I don't, I don't think she got it. <laughs> Patricia's question on the Burr actor is also very interesting because it, it makes me think of the fate or the destiny of all the actors who were born in the UK or in France and who are of Arabic or Middle Eastern um, you know, origin. And you mentioned uh, Mark Strong in Black Gold. And, and there is this idea that they're supposed to be able to speak Arabic or uh, authentic Arabic why many of these actors have spent all their time in Europe, in Great Britain, or in France. So there's this kind of paradox for them, or it's kind of what we expect from them and what we, they can provide. Yeah, uh, you know, um, I think what, um, I mean, consider the restrictions, the limitations to, um, to career, uh, of uh, people who are of, uh, originally from the Middle East. I mean, most of them are going to have a darker complexion. 
than uh, Europeans or people of European origin. Uh, and so chances are they're going to be hired for so-called ethnic roles and maybe often in secondary roles or in a really limited capacity. And so I imagine if you're an aspiring and talented and ambitious uh, actor of Arab origin in um, Europe or in North America, say, or in Australia or somewhere like that, then um, projects, um, independent projects, for example, or transnational projects, uh, ones that are linked to the Middle East, might offer you a chance to play roles, to take on roles that you as an actor have been thirsting for. Uh, but the challenge may well be that you're supposed to speak Arabic. Uh, you know, you're supposed to speak Arabic, and then, and then you might start worrying about the dialect. <laughs> but first, you've got to speak, you actually have to speak Arabic in a way that makes sense. Uh, and I see that, you know, having programs for film festivals, uh, Arab film festivals, I mean, I've come across that often. And I've even had thoughts about, like, how you know, if uh, what an advantage it, it, it seems for certain um, actors to have maybe spoken Arabic at home when they were young, mm -hmm. so that when they had to, when it came around to their playing uh, uh, roles uh, that are centered in the Arab world, they're able to learn the lines well enough to be able to, you know, at least get by. Uh, but it is a challenge that I see often. And you know, there's a re there's reason for for directors to take on these actors who come who are of Arab origin, who um, were born and raised in Europe or America. And the reason is, I think, at least one reason is travel. I mean, you know, productions are often, as we say, international and transnational. And something that's not often discussed, I think, in media studies. Uh, in an analyzing these transnational project, uh, productions is visas. I mean, visas, you know? I think that what, what, uh, with, with, you know, especially I'm familiar with the English language and Arabic language scholarship. The English, English language scholarship is often written by people who are accustomed to simply like, to not really even, even requesting visas in advance, you know? And not really being concerned about being admitted into certain countries. You know, um, and then there's and, and there are other logistical concerns, I imagine, and other other sorts of attractions. But um, you know, I, I think there is also a growing interest in uh, for satisfying the expectations of audiences and therefore programmers in the Arab world, because as was mentioned earlier in this discussion, the Gulf certainly has come to weigh pretty heavily to have quite an impact on Arab production, especially the multinational sort of independently produced production that we were kind of just talking about. And, you know, those programmers, are, even if they, and I think many of them are Arab at this point, are going to be attuned to this kind of thing, language, dialect and such, the kind of thing that might have been missed by you know, film programmers in festivals and people who work for distribution companies in the West, for example. And, and so maybe that's also impacting things. You know, having your film screen in the Dubai International Film Festival is a big deal now. Mm. And there's money to be won. That's all, uh, that's all for me. I've asked them all my questions for the moment. I don't know, Patricia, if you have more questions for our guests. Um, I had just a small question about the ways in which you define subtitles, uh, subtitling in uh, opposition with uh, dubbing. Uh, subtitles ex entail explanation, Dumbe dubbing entails recontextualization, it erases the foreign and it brands the national. And um, so I I wanted you to expand on that, actually. The ways yeah. in which you think that subtitling and dubbing have, uh, you know, the differences between them. Yeah, well, you know, at this point in history and for a while, modern standard Arabic is kind of nationless in the sense it's, it's the language of all Arabic speakers. 
regardless of which what citizenship they hold. But dialect-based language, di um, uh, uh, dialect speech, is can often be associated with particular parts, particular parts regions of the Arab world, and thereby be associated with certain countries. So when I hear somebody's dialect, you know, even even in the case of say multiple dialects from a country, I can sometimes tell, oh, that's like a, you know, that's a, like if I hear somebody, for example, from Lebanon, I can tell the difference be between a dialect from Beirut or a dialect from Tripoli. But if I hear a dubbing in, an, uh, in, in either of those dialects, I'm going to associate this, the person, the character with, a, with Lebanon, with a Lebanese. Doesn't do that. Subtitling, it, you know, because it's in modern standard Arabic, the only leeway you have really is kind of the choice of words for expression, which may signify certain things about the the authority behind the subtitling or the author of the subtitling. But dubbing does so much more. It kind of brands the character with a certain national identity. It also, through sort of verbal communication other than language, such as pauses, such as manner of laughter, such as hiccups or uh, stammering or you know other speech mannerisms, also expresses things that can often be kind of nationally associated or regionally associated. And that kind of thing would be missing from a subtitled text. I understand that perfectly. But I mean, if we go back to the hierarchy of media, for instance, right? Um, it's commonly thought that when it's television programming, then uh, you're going to, you're more likely to dub, maybe, when it's a film. And if it's an auteur film, then you're going to have subtitles. And if you're a cinephile, you're going to what? Uh, you're going to want subtitles but i was thinking more uh, in terms of uh, i mean you talked about animation you talked about uh, children for instance and there are ways in which dubbing is you know a way to discover a culture so i was trying i mean maybe playing the devil's advocate right and not you know, working on reinforcing certain hierarchies in terms of subtitling being better, which I thoroughly adhere to. Mm -hmm. uh, but <laughs> there are, um, I mean, there may be way, I mean, contexts in which, you know, dubbing is the thing. Is there, right? Can it be, can it be more than um, erasing the foreign and branding the national? Yes, I think it can, because I think we need to remember that um, the people who perform the dubbing are themselves artists in a way, they're performers, and so they bring their personalities and their, their skill sets to the dubbing performance. You know, um, as, going back to animation, just because it's such a uh, rich uh, sort, of, um, um, sort of subtopic, uh, you know, not all not all animation programming is dubbed in modern standard Arabic. I have come across, for example, uh, Hollywood uh, animation films, Toy Story, you know, um, uh, um, D Disney films from this from this century, dubbed in Egyptian Arabic. And so, in a way that counters, you're looking sort of for a sort of a counter example. In a way that counters the uh, the convention of relegating dubbing to TV and like the more serious art form, that being cinema, deserving subtitles because that's the sort of more appropriate way of transcribing language. Uh, here we see the opposite being done, where I I watch a lot of. Um, cartoons, TV cartoons, and they are almost all dubbed in modern standard Arabic, but I've seen two or three um, uh, Hollywood um, animation features dubbed in an Egyptian dialect where you can tell that the, the people who performed the dubbing 
are having fun with it. They're kind of bringing their personalities to it. So, you know, I certainly think that in the cases of those films, I could see somebody writing a pretty um, provocative and, and memorable paper about how the performers of the dubbing negotiated the texts so as to express not only their nationhood as Egyptians, but also their personalities. Thank you very much, Mohaned. Thank you. You're welcome very much. You're welcome very much. I enjoyed that. <laughs> uh, will I see you, either of you, at SCMS? I'm not sure. Maybe we should postpone this discussion. Uh, yeah. Not this uh, year. <laughs> not this year, but um, maybe Good sometime on. soon. Uh, I think we're going to have to stop here. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Mohaned. Thank you, Nolwen. And thank you for all the students who have been working very hard at making this conversation possible. Anne, who is on the screen right now, but also uh, Benoit, uh, Olivier, and Gayane, who are well, behind the scenes. Thank you to thank all of you. you. I wanted okay. to Bye -bye. mention it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Can we go off the air? Bye-bye. <laughs>